So in this video, I'm going to be giving a brief introduction to chiral centers, and then I'm also going to be explaining something called the priority rules. So what are chiral centers? Well, a chiral center is basically an atom, normally a carbon atom, that's bonded to four different things, or in other words, it's an atom that has four substituents. So how does this look like exactly? Well, in this model I have here, the black ball is a carbon atom, and it's bonded to four different things, the yellow ball, the blue ball, the red ball, and the whitish gray ball, meaning that it's bonded to four different substituents, right? So what that means is that this carbon atom is a center that's chiral, and as a result, this carbon atom can also be called an asymmetric carbon, right? So, now that we know what chiral centers essentially are, now we're going to look at something else. We're going to be explaining how to identify chiral centers within a compound, right? Now just one more thing about chiral centers is that they also have to follow the tetrahedral arrangement. In other words, if you have a carbon that's a chiral center, it's got to be, its four substituents have to be arranged in a tetrahedral arrangement, okay? So that's just um, a geometrical fact that you should also be able to know, right? So in this first example, um, in this compound here, we're going to be identifying the chiral centers, all right? So first we've got to know where the carbons are. Now, whenever you're drawing something in this shorthand stick method, if there's any atoms missing, it's normally a carbon atom, all right? So just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to be drawing them in, but just keep in mind that they're not always going to be shown on, on an exam or in a textbook, all right? So here we have a carbon. Here we have a carbon. Here, there's no atom listed between these four bonds. We're going to have a carbon, and finally, we're going to have a carbon here. Now, another important rule of thumb is that carbon likes to have four bonds. So in this case, this carbon already has one bond. It needs three more. What are the missing bonds? Again, another shorthand notation is that because carbon-hydrogen bonds are so common in organic chemistry, whenever you're drawing a compound, we normally leave them out, but I'm going to put them in uh, just for simplicity's sake in this case, all right? So here we have a carbon. It's missing three carbon-hydrogen bonds like so. What about this carbon? It's got a double bond here, so it's already got two bonds. It only needs two more bonds, and those two missing bonds are carbon-hydrogen bonds. What about this carbon? It's already got one, two, three, four bonds. Done. No, no carbon-hydrogen bonds at all. What about this carbon here? One, two, three bonds. What's its missing bond? It's the carbon-hydrogen bond. But hold on. They don't exactly look like this because we've already indicated stereochemistry. This carbon-bromine bond, um, well, first of all, there's like a black wedge here. What this black wedge means is that the bromine atom is sticking, is pointing out of the board. It's, it's sticking out of the board. It's pointing towards you, the viewer, okay? And as a result, the missing carbon-hydrogen bond, it's, whenever stereochemistry is indicated, you've got to follow it. So if something's pointing out, the missing bond has to be pointing in. So the carbon-hydrogen bond has to be pointing into the board away from you, the viewer. And the reason for this is because if both were pointing out or both were pointing in, that would lead to instability due to electron repulsion and uh, so on. And we, we don't want to have that in this case, all right? So this is our compound with all the carbons and the carbon-hydrogen bonds indicated, okay? So now which carbons are chiral centers, right? Because chiral centers are normally carbon centers, all right? Um, let's look at this carbon first. Four bonds, one substituent, two, three, four substituents, right? It's a carbon bonded to four different things. Another important thing is that because a chiral center has to have four different substituents, there have to be four uh, single bonds. Because if there's a double or triple bond, you can't have four substituents uh, because it would violate valency and so on. Um, but for now, we're going to look at this carbon. It has four single bonds, but three of its substituents are the same because it has three equivalent carbon-hydrogen bonds. So as a result, this carbon right here would not be chiral. Instead, this carbon center would actually be an achiral center, right? Let's look at this carbon here now. It's, it has four bonds, but it has one double bond. And because it has a double bond, it's only bonded to one, two, three substituents. But 
centers that are chiral have to be bonded to four substituents, not three. If you have a double bond, it can only be uh, it can only be bonded to a maximum of three substituents, never four. Because if you have four substituents with a double bond, that's um, that violates the valency of carbon. All right, we don't want that. So as a result, this carbon would also be a chiral. What about this carbon? It's also also has a double bond present, automatically a chiral. What about these? And also, this carbon also has two equivalent carbon hydrogen bonds, which further shows that this carbon center is an a chiral center. The last carbon we've got to talk about is this carbon right here. It has four single bonds, good so far. What about the substituents? It's got one, two, three, four different substituents. Four different substituents, four single bonds. This carbon center is a chiral center. This carbon is an asymmetric carbon, all right? So how do we show that in this case? You show it by drawing an asterisk, like so. That shows that the center you found is actually a chiral center, a center that's chiral, right? So we're done with this example for now. Let's go to this one, all right? So in this case, I'm going to be leaving the carbons and hydrogens out. Hopefully, you'll be able to identify where they are, the missing carbons, the missing carbon-hydrogen bonds, all right? We're going to look at this carbon. There's a double bond present, automatically a chiral. Same for this carbon here, a chiral. Same for this carbon here, a chiral. And same for this one, also a chiral. The only carbon that's left to discuss is this carbon right here, all right? So it's got the iodine pointing into the board. It's got the hydrogen pointing out of the board towards you, the viewer. So two different substituents. It has a third substituent, this one, and a fourth substituent. Now, you might be thinking, oh, four single bonds, one, two, three, four, four substituents, it's chiral. But in this case, it's not. Because this substituent right here is exactly the same thing as this substituent over there. As a result, this carbon is also a chiral. So as a result, this entire compound is a chiral. It has no chiral centers, and that's perfectly fine. Some compounds are just naturally, naturally like that, okay? Um, so now that we've covered these two examples, I'm going to be going over something called the priority rules. So why do we even need priority rules? Well, when you're naming uh, compounds that are longer and more complex than these, um, they're also going to have chiral centers. And you not only just name a compound using the classic um, IUPAC rules of naming, but each chiral center in the compound also has to be given a specific name. Now, it's nothing too complicated because you can either name a, uh, a center that's chiral R or you can name it S, R or S. And how do we determine whether a center that's chiral is R or S? You use something called the priority rules. So what's the first of these? And it's also a highly important rule. As the atomic number increases, priority increases. So we're going to look at these five substituents. Um, hydrogen, chlorine, the OH group, bromine, and iodine. So what are their atomic numbers? Hydrogen has an atomic number of one. It has one proton. That's the lowest atomic number possible. Chlorine has an atomic number of 17. OH, well, when you're looking at the atomic number for this one, you look at the first atom, O. That's an atomic number of 8 for oxygen. Br, bromine, atomic number 35. And finally, I, iodine, atomic number of 53. So which of these has the highest priority? Iodine with the highest atomic number of 53. Which one has the lowest atomic number? Hydrogen with the atomic number of 1. So from greatest priority to smallest priority, it would be iodine, bromine, chlorine, OH, and hydrogen. That's the proper order from greatest priority to least priority. Now, what if the set of atoms that are directly bonded to the chiral center, what if there's no difference between them, right? And what if, um, yeah, there's no difference between them, what do you do? Do you go to the first point of difference? And from there, you use this rule as the atomic number increases, priority increases, and you find, and then from there, you determine priority. What do I exactly mean by this? Now we're going to look at these three examples. One, two, three different substituents. 
you have CH2, CH2, CH2. These three are exactly the same, but when you look at, but we're not going to stop here because just based on this, we cannot assign any priority at all. After the CH2, you have another CH2I, you have CH2SH, you have CH2Br. This, this, and this. Those are the points of first difference, okay? Right here. So, so for this carbon, what's it, what is the atomic number of carbon? It's going to be 6. What's the atomic number of sulfur? It's 16. What's the atomic number of bromine? 35. So even though each of these three substituents started with CH2, when we look at the point of first difference, because uh, you have bromine here, which has the highest atomic number, the CH2Br substituent has the highest priority, followed by CH2SH, and because CH2CH2I, because this carbon has the lowest, um, lowest atomic number at the point of first difference, it's got to be... It's got to have the lowest priority out of these three. And those are how the rules of priority work, right? Whenever you're dealing with a center that is chiral. And from there, you can determine whether a chiral center is R or S. And I'm going to be talking about that in the next video.